Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking the time to join me. Uh, my name's Harold Leishman. I'm a senior investment advisor at CG Wealth Management uh, based here in Vancouver. Uh, my topic today is uh, liquidity volatility in the Canadian venture capital markets. Um, uh, very briefly, uh, I'm a partner with LLC Private Wealth. We have three uh, pillars to our business. One is a wealth management platform. Uh, the other is a venture capital platform, which I manage. Uh, and the third is a service platform uh, that uh, helps family offices and high net worth individuals and active market participants um, uh, deal in the venture capital markets. Uh, a bit of shameless self-promotion, but it also ties into the topic at hand. Our, uh, our wealth management uh, platform, the 10-year track record is 15% annualized returns and they've achieved that by capturing 100% of the upside volatility and only 50% of the downside market volatility. Uh, and I'll explain why I think this is important. Um, obviously, if you can skip out on the downside volatility, uh, it shortens your recovery period. Uh, you don't have to make as much money on the upside to get back to even. Uh, if you're down 10%, um, you have to make more than 10% to get back to square. Uh, it also prevents emotional decision making uh, at the at the bottom of the market. There was another interesting stat. You know, the uh, the MSCI between 2000 and 2015 uh, generated, uh, I think it was 12% annual returns. And the banks used to always love to say, if you missed the 10 best weeks, um, you know, you would do really poorly. In this case, you'd have a negative return. If you missed the 10 worst weeks, you actually would have generated, I think, about a 16% annual return. So there's more benefit in missing the downside than trying to capture all the upside. Um, and I think that's true for venture capital investing as well. Um, what is liquidity volatility? Uh, simply, as everybody knows, liquidity is the ease with which you can buy or sell assets without affecting the price. And liquidity volatility is just the rate at which that changes or how much that changes. Uh, declining re liquidity uh, means we'll have uh, a harder time in buying or selling and growing liquidity means there's more investors in the space, uh, making it easier to, um, uh, to transact. Our view is that market peaks uh, uh, often coincide with peaks in liquidity. Uh, so as a as a baseline example, uh, this is a, a chart of the S&P 500 uh, monthly dollar turnover. Uh, the far left is 2001. That that first peak is 2008. Uh, you know, actually it's 2007. Um, 2008 probably represents the largest financial calamity um, of our of our lifetime, of my lifetime, uh, certainly of our generation. Uh, as everybody's aware, I think, you know, the value of the S&P went down 48%. Um, the liquidity uh, decreased by about 66% um, in fairly short order. Uh, now, this is different than price action. The, the S&P 500 actually rallied fairly quickly after that, um, after all the selling had flushed through the system. But again, there was very limited liquidity going, uh, going through the system. Uh, what's interesting is it did bottom in about 2012 and um, went on what is arguably one of the greatest bull runs ever of the stock market. Not the greatest, but one of the greatest. Um, and, and liquidity increased by 430% over a nine-year period. So I'd just like you to keep those sort of two numbers in mind. On the downside was 66% decline in liquidity. The upside was 430% over, over nine years. Um, the point is macro matters. And here's a quote from a strategist in the midst of 2008. You know, you can come into the office and spend a lot of time researching companies, trying to understand them like we're all going to do here uh, at Planet Microcap. You put together your portfolio of best ideas. And, and if you get the macro wrong or don't see the macro coming, it doesn't really matter what you've done. Uh, in this case, he was referring to the fact that Congress failed to pass um, uh, a bailout package initially for uh, the financial institutions, and that's when the market truly went into freefall. 
so this chart requires some explanation. Um, this is a Canadian venture market monthly dollar turnover. Uh, so what we've done is we've taken the TSX Venture Exchange and the CSE and added their combined liquidity together. That's represented in the black line. Um, the blue uh, shaded part in the background, there's a pointer here, but I don't think it actually works. It's about halfway through is uh, a sample of the combined index of the CSE and the TSX Venture, just to give you a feel for um, what that indicator is telling you. Um, pre the blue line, the CSC was really insignificant in terms of its weighting. It was less than 1% of uh, monthly dollar turnover. Um, the, uh, the shaded lines at the bottom have no real significance other than it's just a bit of definition. Uh, each bar represents about $800 million a month in, in turnover. Um, and uh, so the first two green bars represent 1.6 billion, so on and so forth. The top of the uh, the red line is is four billion a month in in monthly turnover. Um, at the far left, um, well, actually before that, we'll we'll get on and we're going to look at uh, what these declines represented uh, and how long it took for them to recover. So, I've outlined peaks and troughs as best I can. You can certainly quibble and, and maybe put in more highs and lows. Uh, but I think, generally speaking, um, the information uh, is about the same. Uh, so uh, in 2008, uh, average volume was around 3.8, sorry, 3.9 billion a month pre the uh, pre the crisis. Uh, five months later, uh, the dollar value liquidity had decreased by 87 percent. Remember, the S&P 500 was down 66% and represented a 48% decline in value. Uh, so in this instance, an 87% decline. Um, two years later, there was a big commodity boom, or over two years, there was a big commodity boom as uh, uh, liquidity was pumped into the system. And dollar value liquidity is up over 1,000% in 27 months. Again, the S and P 500 was up 480 percent over nine years in a great in a great bull run. Um, another subsequent collapse of 92 percent down to 461 million. I mean, I can go through all the numbers, but you can see them. And there's a couple of points to be made here. I think um, uh, timing does matter, and understanding where you are in that macro cycle for micro micro caps really does matter. Uh, average down cycles are significantly longer than up cycles, uh, a little over two years. Um, the average down cycle uh, in the same time frame uh, that the S&P 500 had that one huge blow up in 08 uh, onto the big run, we had five equivalent declines in liquidity um, or every two years you have another 2008 or worse. So it's worth understanding what volatility means to you as an investor and um, and how you approach that. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love microcaps. Most of my money is tied up in microcaps, but you have to understand the risk and the volatility. Um, upside periods are reasonably short, a little a little over a year. I am going to back it up. There is there is one item which um, you know scares me the most, um, and that is that uh, that first decline of Sorry, that second decline uh, of down 92% uh, was over 59 months. So I just go back, that's five years. So when you're investing, you have to think longer term and can these investments be successful? Um, because that is almost a worst case, uh, worst case scenario. We're about two years in right now um, into the current decline. Um, it's certainly as large on a percentage basis in terms of no liquidity in the market. Um, what turns around is anybody's guess. Um, you just never know whether it's a mining market, an energy market, the next crypto, AI, whatever it, uh, whatever it might be. Um, so in, uh, you know, in conclusion, it's a very short presentation. Um, I think when you're investing in these micro caps, we look at these things as a semi-private equity model. Um, you're buying small businesses, which really could be owned on a private equity basis. They have a limited liquidity. Um, 
and they can go for long stretches with very little liquidity and certainly not have any ability to raise money or access capital markets. So we like to look at these things with a three-year time frame. What can this business do over that time frame? Uh, do the companies have the ability to self-fund growth or be able to self-fund uh, catalyst for future growth? Um, certainly growth is uh, ideal, but even if they can build that optionality into the business um, on a go-forward basis is, is ideal. Um, and never forget about the macro. It's critical to know where you are in the liquidity cycle. If you buy your portfolio at one of those peaks, it doesn't really matter what you've bought. You know, likely you're going to be significantly underwater for a for a good period of time, um, and that that um, that's my short and sweet uh, presentation. Are there any questions? Do you have any uh, stock ideas that are maybe low liquidity now that might be higher in the future? Uh, I am actually not. I'm actually not going to come up with stock ideas, but I'm happy to share them with you later. There's certainly there's there's a lot of uh, companies trading for low single digit earnings multiples that are growing at you know mid digit growth rates with high margins. Uh, I know Brent Todd was talking about companies trading for less than book value. Like there's there's a ton of opportunities out there. It's a question of figuring out which ones are uh, most most appealing to you. Do you have any favorite teams or sectors right now? I'm I'm sector agnostic, except um, I mean I'm I'm a third generation venture capitalist, so my family uh, was very active in the resource business. My preference is for companies with cash flow, so I would say my favorite sector is cash flow. Um, <laughs> but you know, other than that, it doesn't really matter to me. Perfect. Right. Now we can all go eat. <laughs> Thank you very much.